Welcome to the latest episode of County Conversation, the cricketer's brand new podcast covering all things UK domestic cricket. The show will be weekly as we lift the lid on county cricket and feature me, your host Cameron Punsonby, and a selection of the cricketer's award-winning team. Today we have a debut for our chief correspondent and my favourite of all the cricket journalists, George DeBell. Hello, that's very kind. Suspiciously I kind. Know. Hello, nice it was suspiciously kind. And for the listeners who weren't aware of the, the kind of farce that preceded this recording, I was going to move him quite far down the rankings. But anyway, that's fine. But most excitingly, we have two of the greatest left arm spinners to ever come out of the country. <laughs> First, former England Test cricketer and current Worcestershire CEO, With 143 test wickets and 539 first-class wickets, we have Mr. Ashley Giles. How you doing? Good to be with you. Perfect. And with 38 wickets, an average (laughs) of 19.39 for North Middlesex third 11 with a best of 6 for 34 (laughs) against Uxbridge in 2015, the one and only Nick Friend. Welcome, Nick Friend. Play play cricket is a sham, isn't it? That is a a fraction it's a fraction of the real figure. Hello. I, I trusted it implicitly. I also enjoyed that there was someone you were playing with called George Garrett, and I assumed that was kind of Warwickshire's George Garrett. And no, just just a person. Kent's, just Kent, a person Kent's with George the... Garrett. Kent's George Garrett. I beg his These days. I'll get, beg get his it right. Person. Get your joke. Get your jokes right. I thought the joke went very well, actually. Thank you very much. Anyway, we're going to move on. We're going to start the show. And, well, we've brought Ashley Giles on for the show for a reason because one of the biggest stories in Cowboys cricket at the moment is Worcestershire where he is well in charge and firstly uh, thank you very much Ashley for joining there's only really one place to start and that's kind of the state and the flooding of your ground new road um, it's been underwater seven kind of eight times this winter you did an interview with George uh, that can be found on the cricketer online about a week ago and came out a day before the start of the season kind of detail just how extreme the problems are and some of the options you're exploring about a potential move um one stat that stood out to me was that of the 30 highest floods since 1900 19 have been since well in the last 25 years so this is not a one-off this is a theme it's something that's getting worse Uh, you're not able to play inverted commas at home currently um simply put will worcestershire be able to call new road home in 2025 um Simply put, probably short answer is yes. You know, I, I think, um, it, and just to update you, we've now had eight full floods. We've, we've just had one over the last couple of days. Um, I'm sitting in the boardroom now and out to my right, the water is still halfway over the square. So, you know, that situation's not, not great. Um, as I said a number of times, uh, and as I've said to the members a number of times, I think my job has to be to explore all options and that's options to, to stay at New Road. Um, everyone loves being here. It's one of the most iconic grounds in the world, um, but also to explore what a move would look like if it were possible. Um, you know, as a, when I spoke to George, I think we used the words, this, we just can't go on like this. Um, and we're going to miss two months of the season at least. I'm very concerned about this latest flood in that, you know, we're starting to get close, or we're almost on that knife edge of cutting in towards T20 blast cricket. And to be honest, if that becomes affected, you know, we're looking at a really serious problem. Does this mean, Ashley, that you might have to be looking at playing the first T20 game away from home? Well, that, that's becoming a possibility, definitely. We're, we're, we're trying to remain as confident and upbeat as, as we can right now. Um, the ground was fully covered yesterday. It has retreated, but it's now retreated quite slowly. The water table is so high yeah. that the water is beginning to, to linger. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we, we are absolutely going to have to make some contingency plans, and, and they could be, you know, they're varied. Could we play, uh, could we borrow a ground? Could we play away for that first, first fixture instead of at home? Um, could we play at Kidderminster? We're playing some of the championship games. We have to consider everything, but ultimately we want to be here. It, it's um, certainly easier and, and less damaging from a financial perspective. On the bright side, am I right in thinking that four of your first five T20 games are away? So you may lose that first one, but there's a bit of hope for that mid-June period when you, you play at home more consistently. 
Yeah, absolutely. We're still aiming for the 24th of May return, um, but you're right. If if we did lose that first T20 game and have to play somewhere else, we're then not back or due to be back at New Road till the middle of June. So there is another extended window there, um, you know, and we're, we're all hoping that at some point, surely the sun's got to come out. I know the weather forecast for the next couple of weeks is much better. Um, so we're, we're hopeful and as downbeat as we might seem, and I think my staff might seem at times, and they're, you know, they're pretty, been pretty beaten up this winter. We're trying to remain um, upbeat and confident that we'll be here on the, on the 24th of May and certainly on the 31st of May for that first T20 game. Just in terms of potentials to move away from New Road, what do they look like? Is it a case of a ground share? Would it be moving up the road and sharing with Warwickshire? Would it be borrowing a school ground? Is it building a ground from scratch? There's obviously the, the added problem here of normally if people move home, the money they get for that move is from selling their their house at the time. Uh, I can't imagine, without wanting to kind of be too blunt about it, a, a floodplain is that valuable. Like how does Worcestershire go about trying to find a new home? Yeah, a really good question. We, we'd have to, again, consider everything. Um, ideally, well, we'd have to work with, with the local councils, both county and, and city, um, on looking at, at where a move may be possible. You probably, you know, your best bet to build a first-class venue is probably to start from scratch rather than try and manufacture from something from existing. And of course, if you try and manufacture from something existing, there's, there's, a, there's a tenant already, generally, um, and we don't don't really want to put another cricket club out of business. Um, I think the venue share thing, if you're talking about first class venues, is extremely difficult. Um, you know, we we um, the amount of cricket that goes through any of these grounds is is getting getting more and more. You look at somewhere like Edgebaston and with with the women's game, with a hundred, with Blast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's a hell of a lot of traffic goes through somewhere like that, and that'll be the same around the country. Could you seek kind of a compensation or like ECB help? Um, does yeah, where does England come into this factor in terms of looking after one of their eighteen counties? Well, well look, it's it's our business, our responsibility ultimately, um, but. I was with all the, the county CEOs yesterday and the ECB and the ECB visited this morning here. I feel like we've had, we've had a lot of support, you know, and, and I'm not saying that's a, a lot of financial support right now, but I feel like the ECB are there, they're listening, um, and we'll work with them on a, on a short-term plan if required and certainly on a medium and long-term plan. So I think that relationship's really, really good and strong. Um, and it's going to need to be. You know, it's a really interesting time in the game, not just for us from a, a flooding and ground point of view, but um, for the whole game with what's coming up in this next year, um, that relationship's going to be important. Actually, can I just ask you, you, you obviously come in as CEO, but with DOC responsibilities as well. I mean, how, I mean, as far as first winters go, um, I mean, obviously you came in knowing you'd sort of have a rebuild of the squad to do on the back of the guys who left at the end of last year, but chuck this on top. I mean, how has it been for you? I mean, it feels like you've taken on a role that is you know, sort of two roles to start with, but I don't know, it's probably chucked a couple of extra responsibilities on top. Yeah, you could say that. Um, it, it's been it's been very challenging. I'm lucky I've got a really good, really good team here, a good executive team and a broader team. Um, in my relationship with Alan Richardson, the head coach is, is really strong. Uh, I think if anything, yeah, absolutely, I pick up a lot of director of cricket responsibilities, but I've, I saw, I sort of come down from a chief exec point of view and Richo certainly moved up um, and taken a bit more responsibility, which is, which is great. And we, and I think we do work well together. I think we work really closely on the, the recruitment and I think we've done, done some good stuff there. Um, and we've got some really good guys in that dressing room who have just kept things on an even kill. In fact, that's probably, I know it's going to be a really tough summer and we're back in Division 1, but it's probably the least of my, my concerns at the moment. Mm. Um, we're also currently going through a process to look for a new chair of the board. So that, of course, as well as, well as me managing my level and down, I'm managing up a little bit. And, um, you know, it, it's challenging, but 
I, I've also really loved it. It's it's been my first CEO challenge, my first CEO role. So I'm I'm very much learning as I go as well, and and I'm lucky that I've got that support around me at the club that's helping me. It feels like quite a long time ago that the um, that the extras were sort of, sort of happened last last summer and obviously kept playing till yeah. end of the season. But um, I don't know, just just I guess since we're on the sort of financial side of things, I mean, from a CEO and DOC perspective, I mean, when you're a club that produces a lot of your own players, um, the compensation system as it is right now doesn't offer you a great deal in terms of <laughs> in terms of compensation. Um, I don't know, where do you sort of stand on on the sort of state of play with that and to know how it could be improved? I mean, whether that's as a transfer market or just as a compensation system that that does perhaps sort of better reflect the the work that the academy and the, the sort of first county does? Well, I think that that's key, what you just said there. The, the There is a compensation process in place currently and we've been compensated for, for losing some of our players. Is that level the right level? Well, we're, you know, both sides will argue about that, but my, my personal view is if you're if you're investing in players from what 13, 14, all the way through uh, into your first team, then that comp- compensation probably needs to be better. Um, that's not about holding players back because we we absolutely understand that part of our role is to develop England cricketers. That's what we get central funding for. Um, and we really enjoy that. And, and I've said a number of times that if, if someone like Worcestershire isn't that, if it's not somewhere that, that's, you know, if it's somewhere that stops developing players, then what else are we? Um, so that has to continue. Um, and we have to face facts that these players are going to move on. And, and, they, and some of them should absolutely go with our blessing when they want to, to move up a standard and they want, they want a bigger challenge. Sometimes that does lay elsewhere. Um, Mm. And like it or not, we're all trying to fight it, but the gap is widening between the, um, I think what you'd call the haves and have nots. Um, but that, that's just, that is an evolution. It's very difficult to stop. Mm. But my role is to ensure both you know, out there on the field and, and as a venue, we are sustainable. Uh, and that challenge is becoming more and more difficult, but that's, that's absolutely top of my agenda. Looking, looking at some of the recruitment you've done the last few years, so some of it recruit, some of it preceding you in Kashif Ali, but then um, obviously Alvin De Singh joining this year out of Saka as well, and then even someone like Nathan, Nathan Smith coming in as a sort of all format, all season overseas, uncapped, without a sort of central contract issue that um, plenty of other counties have seen. Is that where you, you guys always don't know, sort of you always have to be a bit different in the way you go about things, a bit creative. I mean, um, quite apart from all the. You know, there's obviously been a lot of talk about what Kashif achieved last mm. week, but I guess him and Yadvinda particularly sort of highlight, um, I guess, what Saka sort of sought to achieve from the first, from the outset, which is that there's an awful lot of untapped talent out there that that, that exists beyond the, the beyond, beyond, uh, beyond the 18 county circuit. Is that, um, I don't know, like when you look at those recruit that those bits of recruitment and probably others as well, Ethan Brooks, guys like that, is that what you guys can can do quite a bit of? Yeah, look, I think every county will do um, a really good and detailed job on recruitment. We, we all know how important it is, but you know, maybe for us, we have to look a bit broader and a bit deeper. And in some respects, I suppose you're taking a bit more of a punt because some of these guys, there's, there's less evidence behind them. But um, you know, I think the key thing for, for us, and, and I certainly know for myself and, and Alan Richardson and, and absolutely for Brett as well, is bringing in the right people. I know I say it a lot, but we've got to bring the right characters in. You know, undoubtedly, they've got to have the ability. They've got to have skills, but they don't have to be the finished product. You know, I think the fun bit for our coaches is is to have the right raw material and develop that raw material and mould it and, and finish it. Um, again, accepting that one day that talent may move on. Um, but that that is part of our jobs. So our jobs are trying to help players go from A to B, and, and in that process, have success. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of the work we've done on recruitment this winter. Cash was before that. Yadvinda, I think, when he gets an opportunity, will be um, mm. will be great. Um, Ethan Brooks, I think, is someone who's not had an opportunity for us yet, but I think he just needs an opportunity and a chance. Um, Rob Jones is one of the 
best people you'd ever meet. We're really lucky to have him, Tommy Taylor, and our overseas to have someone like Jason Holder in our ranks for the first five games, um, and Nathan Smith available for a whole season. You know, again, the timing might just be right there to, to pick someone like him up with all-round skill. The Kiwis are notoriously easy to manage. They just get on with it and, and mix really well in the dressing room. Uh, really good guys to have around. So, yeah, we're, we're happy, but doesn't... You know, we're, we're one game in, really good performance against against the Bears, um, but it's a long way to go. Um, hmm. Pleasing start, Nick, I think I could say. Well, may I ask about... Um the current plans or discussions around the 100 and private equity and stuff. Does Worcestershire's current predicament, financial challenge, influence those discussions at all in that you might be persuaded to make, I don't know, shorter term decisions than would otherwise be the case if you had uh, secure finances? Um, Well, I think... In some ways, if, if the finances in the game were more secure more broadly, then, then yeah, the, the, some of the discussions might be different. But from my perspective, I think, I think the game needs an injection of investment. We certainly do as a club. Uh, I think we, we won't be alone on that front. Uh, and I do feel that the hundreds probably our best vehicle right now to inject more funds into the game. So all of those things coming together... Um, you know, and, it, and it's about, and I try to stress this absolutely to our members, is what it's about is not about a change in the game and losing Red Bull cricket. I think it's about trying to sustain Red Bull cricket in the long term and the counties and the 18, you know, these 18 satellites of cricket around the country, which at the moment they could be in threat. So um, I see this as a, a I think it's a good move, and I think it's a necessary move. What do you think investors will want, though? Because they'll want a return, won't they? Um, well, look, it's it's not my um, not my great strength the, um, investment strategies, but there'll be a number of different investors and investor types, I'm sure, as well, from from private equity to high net worth individuals. They'd be from America, India, etc. I think there'll be a lot of interest. Some of that interest may be in a in a smaller stake, a minority stake. Some may want more than that and more control. So um, it is a uh, it is an interesting time go forwards. Most people, when they invest, they want a return on their investment. But I think what people are always or also buying when they buy into English cricket is the culture, the the, the history, the game. And that's hugely valuable. We shouldn't give that away for nothing. And we should be careful who we give that away to um, because it's it's very precious. You know, a, follow, a following for cricket across all formats is still really strong. Um, and so I think that's why this, it's going to create a lot of interest. Well, once we've given it away, though, or sold it, sorry, you know, once we've lost high summer and control over it, which we might have done already, to be fair, don't we reflect that nearly all the problems that we're dealing with, not the least that you're trying to play cricket on a floodplain in early April, stem back from the fact that there's this big white ball window in the high week in, in the weeks of high summer? Um, look, I think what, whatever anyone thinks about hundred, uh, I think it's here to stay. We are seeing this this shift globally between uh, franchise cricket and um, you know bilateral cricket. England v Australia, etc. That shift has happened, and it's continuing to happen. And I think if we if we don't get on board with it, um, we could easily find ourselves on the wrong side. Uh, and I think it's I th- for me, I think it's important that the hundred becomes one of the top three uh, franchise competitions in the world. And and for me, the only way to do that is to get outside investment and pump more money through it. That's still no guarantee that you're going to be in that top three, but uh, you're seeing around the world the emergence of these competitions. The, the big one, probably on everyone's minds, is America, Major League Cricket, and that that's a, that could be a real threat, um, and that could be a threat anyway because for our player pathways, and I do think English cricket produces a lot of really good cricketers. 
with uh, Major League cricket running through the summer, that, that could pose a strong threat to our best young players. Ashley, with, um, we actually had a lot of listener questions on kind of Worcestershire's position on private investment in the 100. There's, a, there's quite a lot of moving parts here. So to try, to try and explain for those listening, there was, and when I say I'm going to explain, I'm actually going to pinch uh, Will McPherson from the Telegraph's explainer uh, because he was far, far better explaining than I, than I possibly could. Uh, but in effect, the kind of current rumoured proposals that each county will be given, each host county will be given 51% of the 100 franchise to sell or keep as they wish. The other 49% remains with the ECB. And the ECB, try and keep up, uh, who have agreed to sell a portion of their own share, 30% of their own share, I think. And then that is what's divvied around the counties. That's where the kind of the battleground is. Um, the debate is whether the portion from the ECB will be shared around 19 counties, so 18 first class counties and the MCC, or the 11 non-host counties. And the difference for the likes of Worcestershire it's like, is millions of pounds in effect. Um, Surely your kind of job and your position is to push for that to be shared around 11 counties rather than 19. And how can you do that if if your bargaining chip chips are weaker, in effect? Um, good explanation, Cameron. That, that was, that was good. Much. I appreciate that. Will McPherson has done a very good job there by uh, <laughs> reading it word for word. Yeah, and as usual, Will gets the inside track from somewhere. I'm, I'm not going to get drawn... I'm not going to get drawn on what those discussions are and those percentages right now. There's a lot of discussions going on. Ultimately, you know, we all own the 100 with the ECB. We're all shareholders in the 100. How that, how that, if, if that we come to the point where we sell a stake in the 100, then how that is divvied up is, is obviously going to be the, the big, the big question. But I think, you know, it feels to me that the majority are motivated for this to happen for the right reasons. Um, and I'm sure we'll find the right answers. I don't think um, anyone wants to end up in a fight. But of course, as you said, Cameron, my, my ultimate responsibility is to Worcestershire cricket. So to ensure we get the best possible, to call it a deal is, is um, I suppose that's, you know, ultimately what it is. But that's my, that's my job. Um, but we, we also have to work together. And, and my sense so far, whether it be with the ECB or the, the other CEOs, is that, that we are. So week one came to a close a few days ago. We had just the one result across the two divisions as the weather beat everyone bar Essex, who thanks to a Sam Cook tenfer, beat Notts by 254 runs. My personal favourite part of that match, however, was Essex opener for Rose Cushy getting done for his bat being too big. And so all the points that Essex may, had won, maybe at risk with a, a points deduction. Um, I guess Ashley, as a, as a county cricket CEO, isn't allowed to say it's funny as well, but I'll say it for <laughs> everyone on the podcast and say it's quite a funny thing to get caught out on. Sam Northeast made 334 not out, the highest score in first class history at Lords. Harry Brook made a 69 ball century, which again, very funny, just proves he's better than everyone else. And my second favourite performance of the week, Ben Mike, in his first match against his former club, Leicestershire versus Yorkshire, made 90 and took four for, which must have just felt phenomenal. Uh, but the main talking point, probably of, from an overarching point of view, was the use of the kookaburra. Nick Friend, um, Alex Stewart said it, I think, I think I'm quoting directly here, that it was the worst <laughs> idea ever, um, which... I mean, I'm not really sure what he thinks. I don't. I would like to ask him some more questions about that, just to appreciate the nuance. Um, but what are the kind of thoughts on the ground from players and coaches of the Kookaburra? Um, slightly more nuanced than that, I think. I mean, no. It's only, I mean, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Like from from the various conversations I've had with players, coaches, etc., is it feels like the centerpiece this debate is almost the forgotten it's very easy to look at the ball in itself and talk about the limitations of the ball I think the surface is um a vital in this and I think the surfaces are one of the reasons it sort of worked last year because it was late June early July fairly dry period a lot of spin was bowled a lot of wickets taken taken by spin um and people went away and said well it saw a 10 percent increase in the amount of spin bowled therefore has done a job of sorts. Um, and when the surfaces are dry and the outfields are abrasive, etc., I think the idea is also that you can sort of get some reverse swinging later in the piece and 
keep the seams interested for more than that sort of first, I don't know, 15, 20 over periods, if, if that. I mean, I guess the limitations to doing that in April, at the end of a very, very wet spring, on the back of a very, very wet winter, is that um, I, everyone's just very, just, just slow and damp. And um, I was at Lords for three, three of the four days and I saw, so I was, I missed day two. I reckon I saw uh, 14 wickets in three days and about a thousand runs. And of course, 335 of those were scored by Sam Northeast. And it's, I think it's really important not to, to sort of downplay that achievement because everyone played with the Kookaburra. It's been played, played with all over the world for a long time, etc., etc. Still a lot of runs, still got to play bloody well and do something that very few people have done before. Um, the, the general consensus from, from what chats I've had is that if you get the surface right and you, and you keep the ba- the crucial thing is having the balance right, isn't it, between bat and ball and ball and pitch. Um, I think where it becomes difficult is if you've got a ball on a damp surface that uh, essentially the ball dies with, with, the, with the moisture and goes soft and the seam goes in itself and you can't get it to reverse and there's not much there for the spinner. Um, but equally, we saw Sam could take, take 10 wickets and not to get rolled for 80. So it would be cheap to say that it was all the same as it was at Lord's. Um, I know that Sam Cook prefers bowling with the Cooker Bar, for example, because his view is that it feels slightly lighter from the hand and allows him to go at full throttle earlier than he does with the Dukes. So everyone's got opinions. I mean, Grant Bradburn, who I spoke to at the end of play at Glamorgan, is very in favour, um, just as Mark Robinson isn't and Alex Stewart isn't. And I'd be interested to know where, where Worcestershire fall on it as well. But, um, but yeah, it's... Um, Nuanced as I started with, I'll finish with that. <laughs> where, where do Worcestershire sit on it, Ashley? Is it kind of? I, I, I know I'm not meant to say this as the host of a, of a county cricket podcast, but I, I kind of shrug my shoulders and I go, okay, like if it helps bowlers get used to it and develop their skills, then great. But it kind of the end point, as far as I can tell, is what's what's the point? If the point is we're going to use this part of the season to help people develop our skills, then fine, whatever. I think Ollie Robinson said as much kind of last year in New Zealand he thought the two rounds was too few and four probably feels a bit more of a kind of sweet spots but then on the flip side if the case is let's to use a sporting terminology uh, what's the word emphasize our super strength with the Duke's ball then let's just keep nicking people off at 82 mile an hour like is in the changing room it does do people care is it a point of discussion or yeah take us into the well, Worcestershire mindset yeah I mean firstly I've probably had a few bigger issues to think about than, <laughs> than just the state of the Kookaburra. And I'm not in the dressing room a hell of a lot. I go in occasionally. Yeah. Um, I think the intent's good. And we've seen, you know, we saw in that first round, Cook cleaned up um, by doing his super skill, which is banging away, hitting probably the top of off, middle and off, and just putting batters under the pressure all the time. Now, that's good bowling. So whether the ball's like a bit of soap, a balloon or whatever, um, you know, I think if, 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 if we can teach those skills, so it's harder to get batsmen out and you've got to be more consistent, if that's the intent, then absolutely. That's great. It's not, we shouldn't be making it easy. So again, in that sense, if the wickets are going around a bit, I know it's not ideal. I think the ball got quite big when it got wet. That's not ideal, but... Early season, you expect the pitches to go around a bit more. So take away, take away some of that. You know, you don't really want 600 v 600, but the game at Edgebaston would have been an absolute belter if the weather hadn't have intervened. Um, so I see both sides. Ultimately, saying all that, you know, you just we just should be playing on better pitches that make it more difficult naturally. But if you can't do that, what's in your armory? We well, you might have to change the ball and and, and try different things. So. I'm slightly, uh, clearly from my response, Cameron, I'm slightly sitting on the fence. But um, to play it for a couple of rounds um, and make things harder so that when when people get to India or get to New Zealand, when it flattens out wherever and it becomes more difficult, if it teaches you better skills, then, then why not? I think the one thing to jump in on, that, on the back of that as well is that ECB have been pretty clear that this is a trial and... The reason for doing it at the start and the end of this season is as much as anything because they did it in the middle of last season. And this all, essentially, I think at the end of this, you, you then end up with data, data at different from different points of the season showing what worked, what didn't work, 
Um, so you touched on the spin stuff before um, from from last year, and I suspect what you might find is, um, I don't th- essentially, I don't think this is the long term, you know, solution or desire to have two here to the end of the season. I think the idea has very much been to work out what works best and see if it, this does work best. I, yeah, I, I can already see though, kind of in a year's time, they go, oh well, it's too small a data set to be able to make any decisions. We've got two matches from 2023 in the middle of the season and you get one match from... Anyway, um, I want to ask George a question about kind of starting in April and my favourite of all the quotes to come out of county cricket in the last week was a Sussex spokesperson said to the Telegraph about the fact that Sussex have decided not to use their floodlights this season in the county championship because it's too expensive in short and that might have cost them a win in their first round of the county championship. Now... You might think it was a purely financial decision. However, the quote reads as such. Firstly, we believe Red Bull cricket should absolutely be played under normal daylight conditions. And the use of floodlights in this format is not the way the game should be played. George, is the use of floodlights in Red Bull cricket immoral? Wrong. Where has this come from? Um, I would have kind of, maybe I'm, I'm more than happy for you to say I'm, I'm wrong here, but... I would have thought in, in, a, in a week where we lost kind of days worth of cricket to the weather, if we were able to squeeze out another 45 minutes at the end of the day, that's probably a good thing. And does it again all just come down to the fact that we were starting the season in the first week of April when it is uh, very cold, wet and quite dark? There's a lot in there, Cameron, eh? Um, <laughs> well, I like to give you the, the, the tough questions. I, I know that you can I, I'm, I'm sum everything up to... very succinctly. I'm inclined just to say, yes, Sussex are immoral, but I fear it will be clear. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Go no, out no, on no, social I media and I'll be abused. For that'll that. do. End of show. Oh. Cheers, though. That bill do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, I think that uh, it probably comes down to finances and the fact are that they're, they're struggling, like a lot of the counties are really, really struggling. I, felt, I was at Sussex the other day and uh, I, they would appear to be competing. This is a bit of an offshoot, mm. but bear with me. No. for um, one of the women's teams with Hampshire. And if you saw how much both those clubs wanted to host a women's team, I don't know why you wouldn't give them both one. And if and if there are 10 compelling cases, let's have 10. Let's have 12. Uh, they desperately want one, and that's a really, really good thing. And we want more people to play, and we want to grow the game. Anyway, bit of a bit of a uh, irrelevance. We've got to be a bit careful with all these things. Like Nick said... Remember that this is an experiment. Now, I don't much like the Duke's, uh, sorry, the Kookaburra Ball. I don't think it's as good. I don't think it's as fun. But I can see why they're doing it. And it does expose some of the problems we have in the English game. And the fact is, you shouldn't really start an experiment knowing exactly what you're going to get at the end of it, you know? The intelligent thing to do is is to collect the data over four games, to be fair, this summer, Cameron. And then have a look. Are we playing too early? Look, personally, I always can't wait for the cricket season to start. Uh, And my phone reminded me, funnily enough, a couple of days ago um, of being with Wilmot Fearson, funnily enough, at the Oval and having to put on sun cream from the start of a season very recently. So the English weather isn't that predictable and reliable. Uh, but I do think that there is a consensus that we're starting too early. But what worries me about all this, and you have to take everything together, is that we're going to go end up in a situation almost inevitably where we cut to 10 championship games. And I think that's a shame. And I think that uh, the England strategy right now is to copy what's going on everywhere else. And you can turn on the TV at any time of day. I mean, Remember in India, you would turn on and you'd see the South African League, which was fantastic. And you could see the Dubai League, which didn't look quite so good. Um, And the point being that there was cricket on all the time. Just there is. And it's the same players playing in very similar shirts all the time. Now, does the world need another one of those? Maybe. Maybe we need our share. Maybe if everyone's doing it, that's the thing to get into. Or maybe we could have gone a different way with it. Personally, I would have been uh, proudly different and English. I would have embraced two divisions. I'd have been the only one of those leagues in the world with promotion and relegation. And, and, and it concerns me that we're in a situation where a club like Worcestershire, which I care very much for, is going to be better off not playing cricket. 
That cannot be right. We've got to get back to basics. And surely it's about playing, being that satellite, um, developing players, inspiring uh, uh, both new uh, spectators and players. And I think that we've put short-term financial interest before uh, growing cricket. But, you know, I, I've absolutely lost this argument. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I've, I've bored Ashley with it before. And I've bored Richard Gould and Richard Thompson and, and a million other people. And um, I think they've all got some sympathy for it. I think Ashley knows where I'm coming from. But uh, the lure of the, the money is, is great. And they think that it will bring better players into the game. And I'm not so sure that it will anyway. And also, I think that there's a lot to be said for developing local heroes. But can I so, can I make another leap? Oh goodness me! Of course, George, leap away. Well, I remember at the at the end of the last Ashes in Australia, Ashley did a press conference, and he said, and "Correct me where I get this wrong. <laughs> you can sack me, you can sack the coach, you can sack the captain, but we'll be in exactly the same place in four years unless we make more significant changes." And I thought, that is spot on. But Tom Harrison didn't. <laughs> so he did sack you. He did sack the coach. He did. Um, and, and the captain changed too. Um, what changes would you have made if, if you were king of cricket rather than king of Spain or rain or whatever else? Uh, what changes would you have made? And it is actually the Kookaburra experiment one of those things that you might have thought about? And as things stand right now, this, this question goes on forever. Are, are we actually very likely to be sitting in the same position in a couple more years with Rob Key and Brendan McCullum answering the same sorts of questions? Okay. Um, firstly, the, the Kookaburra issue. I wasn't a huge fan. That wasn't one of my one of my babies. I wasn't I wasn't huge on that coming in. Um, what would I do? Well, firstly, on the schedule. I think as George touched on, we're simply starting early because, you know, and I think I said back then, George, we, we, you know, what we need to invent is more months. And that's, that's a pretty difficult job. We're playing so much cricket, but quite simply, I think I feel if I put my director of cricket hat back on, particularly like the other directors of cricket, that the current schedule just isn't high performance. It isn't breeding high performance. And if anything, it's actually dangerous. Um, some of the player movement this summer around uh, the T20 Blast, particularly in the travel, could be dangerous. Um, uh, and, and that's probably one of my biggest fears for us as a game, that risk, because ultimately they are our responsibility. Um, what would I, and this is just me, I'm not trying to give you Worcestershire's position. George asked me um, what I would like to see, look, I think the 100 is here and the 100 the here to stay. So we've got that block. I'd love to see us being able to play Red Bull cricket deeper into the summer and more consistently. I think the only way to do that is to move a little bit away from this blocks of cricket that, that we've created. And, and we know probably from a, from a high performance point of view, that might be better to produce players. But now if we're calling the 100 our premier white ball competition, okay, that, that sits in a block that stays there. I think the only way you can do that is almost move to a more of an appointment to view for your for your T20 Blast, which is is such a, an important product for for us and some of the other smaller venues. Um, played every weekend, whether it be a Friday or a Saturday or some some weeks twice a week, twice a, over a weekend. And play your Red Bull cricket through the week and and um, you know, you could then play it much deeper, right up to the 100 almost, because I know it's a long time ago. When I reflect back on my career in bowling in the middle of the summer with Neil Smith the other end, when the sun's out and the pitches are spinning, and you just know you're going to bowl all day. I just don't see spinners getting that opportunity nowadays. So that's one area we need to develop spin. Um, I think we need to, you know, we've got to have better surfaces. I touched on earlier because... That will help us um, and a better schedule develop bowlers who bowl generally faster, which we know, you know the best teams I played in had had a barrage of bowlers who could bowl mid-80s or quicker. Um, so all the things we've talked about that you might need to win in Australia 
um, in India, alongside obviously batters who can bat for long periods and score big runs. Um, Would you centrally contract ground staffs? Uh, I don't know about that. It did come up. I don't think so. I just think, again, it comes down to the intent. Um, and I think we all actually want English cricket to go the right way. But, you know, one of the unforeseen or unintended consequences of divisional cricket, of course, it, it creates really good competition, but it creates this, I've got to stay up. I've got to go up. I can't go down when actually, and I think a lot of members don't actually understand this. There's no financial benefit whatsoever to being in division one or division two from, from funding. Yes. Of course, if you win, absolutely sponsorship point of view, maybe, but actually the difference is, you know, it's negligible really. And actually all it does, it almost encourages the system where we try and compete with Surrey which frankly is ridiculous. Yes, great on the field, we can go and try and compete with them, but we do not have anywhere near the sort of budgets um, that they have. And that's not that they've got greed or anything else, they've just got a completely different business model that can generate much more revenue. So, um, you know, what we should be about uh, is developing guys who can play at that very top level. You know, part of what we're doing with the whole game should be about protecting test cricket and making it very special. Um, you know, the current guys are going about it a slightly different way. They're playing, you know, we all want, we all want our players to go out and play positive cricket and enjoy their cricket. Absolutely. You know, that's a given. It's not always possible in certain situations as, as I, as I found out. Um, but ultimately, you know, test cricket still remains precious, important, but if we're going to win in Australia and India or challenge in Australia and India, even challenge, we're going to have to do things slightly differently. And some of those I've touched on. Quite disappointed not to have found out from everyone whether they think floodlights are immoral, but it's fine. I'll, I'll live with that. We'll, we'll move on. I think just, just for the record on that, I think it's an incredibly powerful statement if you say we cannot, we literally cannot afford to turn the lights on. I think in terms of the kind of doom and gloom we've discussed in this in the last 40 minutes, a very powerful statement. We have lost, potentially lost the chance to win a match because we couldn't keep the lights on. Saying it's immoral. Not for me. A bit silly, I would think. Anyway, we're going to move on to the third and final part. Right, time to finish with some questions. We put out the call for some listener questions and you have answered. We did one earlier on in the show when we asked Ashley about kind of Worcestershire's position on private investment. I'm going to ask you one more and this, I believe, is from Mr. D.A. Franklin about to Ashley, which is between between playing championship matches over five days or aligning pitch standards with tests, allowing spinning pitches from day one or allowing spinning pitches from day one, which would have the greatest effect with regards to developing English spinners. Basically, you have a magic wand. You can do one thing. We're going to turn out four test match spinners next year. What, we, what would you choose? Uh, well, I don't think it's one thing, but I think better pitches playing cricket spread more throughout the summer um, would would be much better. Wonderful. And the question to Nick Friend, can you throw forward to round two for us? What are you looking forward to? What are you excited about? What's getting, what, yeah, what makes Nick Friend of a weekend? <laughs> Will County Cricket get very excited and think, oh, I can't wait for this. Um. There's a lot of narrative knocking around, isn't there? It's the jo you've got the Jordan Cox derby, you've got the oh, yeah. all the Worcestershire players derby, um, you've got Scott Bowler's debut for Durham, most likely. Joe Root's back playing for Yorkshire in their squads. Um, I didn't say in their squad, I assume he'll be selected. Um, I don't know. Um, I well, you know, waiter runs, waiter runs, you've got to work your way in. Uh, Sam Northeast, I think, is 515 for none since he was last out in the championship. Q first baller tomorrow morning. Um, but yeah, you know, obviously there are four teams who have not played yet. So interesting to see how they go against teams who are sort of not just a week further on, but in some cases much further on because of how wet pre-season was. Um, I think Glamorgan did 211.2 overs in the field at Lords on the back of having had one and a half days pre-season cricket. So interesting to see how they're, <laughs> how their bowlers shape up. They're actually bowled down because Craig Miles has been Recalled already by Warwickshire, um, which 
probably speaks to that sort of like early season. This is another thing about the Kookaburra early season is that if your loads are slightly down and then suddenly you're bowling on an unresponsive pitch with a wet ball um, and doing that for a prolonged period of time, then, I don't know, we're sort of talking about how we... It's interesting, isn't it? Like you, the, I guess all the talk is about how the Kookaburra will show who the guys are who can bowl quick and reward those guys. But the the upshot is you don't want to break people by using that ball on a at a time when the pitches don't really suit it. Um, not saying that's what's necessarily happened with Miles, but you know, Liam Norwell's got another injury at Warwickshire. But, um, but yeah, I'm at Gloucestershire, Yorkshire to watch Bro- Brook and Root, hopefully so. Um, yeah, um, as you say, very excited for a weekend in Champo Cricket Camp. <laughs> I mean, I'm excited for you. I'm excited for you. I'll, I'll be down at the Oval because uh, naturally, as part of the cricket media, I only care about Surrey. Um, if you do want to get in touch and have questions for our cast of Cricketer Journalists or our guests, then please do get in touch on Twitter at the Cricketer Mag or anything longer can be emailed to website at thecricketer.com. Nobody covers county cricket like the Cricketer and you can get access to our coverage of all 18 teams online from as little as £3.99 a month. Our own top team of county champions have now won the outstanding online coverage of domestic cricket prize at the ECB Domestic Cricket Journalism, Journalism Awards. I can't read the word of my job. Uh, awards for six years running, so you don't have to take our word for it. Just click in the sh- show notes to subscribe. That's it for week two. I know, well, everyone's going to be off at their respective matches this weekend. I'll be at the Oval uh, shouting at floodlights. But until next week, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the show and we'll see you and speak to you next week.